First Peter. series title is, is uh, oh, something, Stirring Up God's Elect, <laughs> Stirring Up God's Elect, and, and the, uh, the idea originally, and we haven't even dealt with this yet, but my idea originally was we went through the 12 disciples talking about them, and we ended on Peter, and I really wanted to look at the, his letters having, you know, studied and thought about uh, some of the aspects of his life. And I haven't really been able to make much of a comparison yet, but I plan on doing that soon. And uh, But today, just a really quick, I don't want to do this every time, but since we're still in the first chapter, just really quick, it starts out, we see that he's writing to the elect that are scattered abroad, and it talks about how they're strangers in that land. We make the application how all believers, and we're, we're the elect today, right? All, all those who trusted Christ uh, are part of the elect. And, and so we see that a lot of this is going to apply to us, though he might not have been specifically writing to us at the time. It applies to us, okay? And then we saw uh, how we're on the winning side and uh, talked about it kind of being like a spectator sport. And some are watching, the angels are watching, the pro prophets of old uh, prophesied and, and, and waited uh, patiently to see how things were going to unfold. And then last week we talked about uh, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober-minded and be thinking in ways that are going to help us be able to live out the Christian life as we, as we do that. Now, today, I want to just talk about something that has in, kind of intrigued me as I go through and read these, uh, these chapters. Am I just a little bit too loud? I think maybe, maybe just a touch back or something. I don't know. It sounds like it's, it's really loud to me. Okay, so uh, uh, as I'm reading through First and Second Peter, making preparations to preach it, and, and I'm doing little studies and maybe I've gone kind of overboard with my word studies for Sunday school. <laughs> I keep finding all these word studies. Uh, but the word that kept jumping out at me as I'm reading this, and it says it a few times or something along those lines, is uh, incorruptible or uncorruptible or all that, you know, other places in the Bible kind of comparing Scripture with Scripture. I saw this. And there are a lot of times where this idea, this concept of things that are incorruptible just kind of jumps out at me and, and uh, jumps out the re to the reader. And I want to talk about that, but it's going to be a little different because not really following it in the order as, P as, it, ha as it is in 1 Peter. But we're going to look at some of these passages, but I want to present it in such a way that... Uh, uh, the, what we'll, we'll do is I'll, I'll kind of break it down almost logically, in a logical order, looking at through the Bible things that are, inc that are incorruptible, why they're incorruptible, all that, um, all that kind of idea. And I'm going to try to do that about, it's going to be five parts, try to make sense out of this, things that are incorruptible. But the thought as I went through that, studying that out, still sounds really weird. Does it not sound funny to everybody? It sounds if, to me like it's just ringing or echoing or something. Okay, as long as it's good for you guys. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, here's what I got to thinking about. I know this is, everybody knows this, this is nothing special, but it just kind of struck me in a, in a special way. Everything in this life is corruptible. Everything in this life. And uh, we'll read a passage here in a minute where it talks about our faith. And it, and it says, it's better than gold which perisheth. Now, in our minds, something like gold is about as close as you can get to something that doesn't perish. Right? You know, gold doesn't perish. What are you talking about? Well, everything in this world it corrupt, is corrupt. And if there's anything that's lasted since the beginning of, of the creation of the world until now, guess what? One day it's going to perish. Because this whole world's going to uh, perish, right? So everything in this world is corrupt. And when you start thinking about that, I'm corrupt, you're corrupt. Uh, that means everything dies. Everything perishes. Everything, and, and this is kind of contra 
contradictory to what evolution says, because evolution kind of says that things are going to get better, right? As this one race is going to be more superior than the other, and the, the, the genes that survive are going to be better, and, the, and in some degree things are going to get better over time, when in actuality we know by looking around the world everything gets worse. You could go back to Adam and Eve, and I don't know what they looked like, but their genes were perfect, which is Partly, I think there are several factors, but maybe partly why people lived so long way back then and then slowly started to get, you know, their, their years started to get less and less. And, uh, and I think some of that might be had to do with genes. The genes were so pure at that time. You know, people always make jokes about uh, Cain had to marry his sister, right? How did, you know, how did, who was Cain's wife? Well, it had to be his sister. And people thought, think that's weird. And well, to, by today's standards, one of the main reasons that's weird is because of the way that it's like that's too close. The genes, you know, uh, somebody could be deformed or somebody, you know. Uh, so we obviously in the Bible teaches at some point in the law, it taught incest is wrong. But at the very beginning, you know, it had to be that way, and it makes sense because the genes were perfect. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? But the idea is that everything decays. Everything perishes, and it's corrupt. And somebody might look at that and say, well, why would God make things that way? Have you ever, has anybody ever asked you, you know, well, if, there, if God was such a good God, such a loving God, why would he let these innocent people die? And, I, and it always boggles my mind. I know I've shared this before, but how many people I knock on the door and they say, well, I don't even believe in God. Well, why not? Well, because I was praying that my grandpa would live and he died. And I'm thinking, don't you know he was going to die eventually? <laughs> I mean, at some point you have to realize, hey, everything dies. Everybody dies. Everything is corrupt in this world. And we know as Christians, I don't have to make a long message about this and go back to Genesis, but I think we all know where that came from, all right? Sin. It was God's punishment on the world. He, uh, the world is now cursed by God. You go back to Genesis and you can see that it's corrupt and everything is under this system of decay and uh, corruption and everything is going to perish now because of sin. But when we read through the Bible, we see a lot of things are mentioned that are incorruptible or one place says uncorruptible, which we'll see in a second, yeah, or they don't perish. Okay, Now, where are those things? Well, the only thing, uh, the only things that we see in this life that don't perish are things that are not tangible to us because they're spiritual, all right? And so here's why. The first point is this. God is incorruptible. God is incorruptible. Look at Romans chapter 1. Oh, I was going to read 1 Peter first. That's all right. Go ahead and go to Romans. Hold your place in Peter. We'll come first. Peter, we'll come back. Romans chapter one. And look at verse twenty three. Well, I got to back up. Let's go to verse twenty. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into an image made like a cor to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And so here's what he's saying, the, that, that mankind's heart, and really you could trace this back to the beginning, okay? But mankind's heart decided... Uh, you know, probably one of the highlights of this, uh, the, to illustrate this point, is when the, when the children of Israel were up on the mountain 
I mean, I mean, while Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments and the children of Israel were like, well, we need a God. Somebody make us a God. <laughs> and he was talking to God up on the mountain, but they wanted this golden God. And they said, this is the God that brought you out of the... So man had this desire to just make his own God. And so this is the, the heart. Uh, this is the, the, the manifestation of the heart that, that displeases God so badly that they would just say, I need to make my own God and not recognize, not to give glory to the real God, but they made statues out of things that can't hear, can't see, and are corruptible. And God said that was one of the first commandments, right, is not to uh, make anything like that and not to worship those because we're supposed to worship the true God. And one of the things that makes us worship God is recognizing how far beyond us he is. The fact that he is incorruptible. The Bible talks about him as being pure, right? When it talks about him being light, I don't understand that, but every description of God is light, and it's like so bright people can't see it. And, it's, it's, uh, and everything is, he's just talked about as being perfect and, and being uh, holy, 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 right? People falling down on their face in his presence because he's so far beyond. He is incorruptible. Now, when he made everything he makes, right, should be incorruptible as well because he's incorruptible. But through sin, he decided to curse his creation to make it incorruptible, okay? Now, the Bible talks about a tree of life that was put in the Garden of Eden, right? Then that, they, were, they were not allowed, after they ate of the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, uh, Cain and, I mean, uh, Adam and Eve and his son uh, and their sons, everything, weren't allowed to go eat of the tree of life. It was guarded later on, I think, taken to heaven is the way I understand it. And so the tree of life is in heaven to this day. The people weren't allowed to take of that, lest in their sin you know, sinful condition, corrupt uh, condition, they would live forever, and that would be a bad thing. So he took the uh, tree to heaven. I believe there's a real tree, just like there's a, I believe there's a real river of water of life. Look at Revelation 22. And let's think about this for a minute. This isn't a main, a major part of the, le of the message, but I want to just think about this for a minute. Because the main thing I'm wanting to get across here is how... Uh, perfect God is in opposition to uh, our, our sinful nature, our corrupt flesh that's going to perish. God uh, will never perish. Now, Revelation 22, and look at the first two verses. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life? Don't ask me how. It grows off of both sides or something and comes up in the middle. I don't know, but you got one tree there on both sides of the river, uh, which bare 12 manner of fruit and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. I believe this is literal. I believe there is a real tree, the tree of life. I believe there is a real river, the river of the water of life. And I believe that these indeed give life. But I don't believe they need to because God could just make it like there's, these are not more powerful than God, right? And I preached in the, uh, the message on Sunday morning about Moses. And the last thing I was talking about was that rod and how if you think about it, that rod is just a stick. But God allowed that stick to be able to do great miracles, but it was really God that was doing the miracles. He just decided to use that stick. And so I think about that. He created, he decided to make this tree that gives life. He could have just given life himself, but he decided to do that. And this water that gives life. Some of it might be symbolic. Think about the temple. There's a lot of symbolism there, but God still wanted there to be a temple, and there was a literal temple. But the fact of the matter is these are all just pictures of the life that God gives, right? And, and just ways of showing he's incorruptible. He can give eternal life, even though we don't have eternal life uh, in, this, in this world, under this sun. We don't have eternal life because everything in this life has to perish. Okay, so therefore, uh, there's only one 
being who is incorruptible. I think everybody gets it, all right? So I don't believe there had to be this real uh, tree and all that, but I believe there is. All right, secondly, so first of all, God is incorruptible. Okay, that's where it all starts. God is incorruptible. Okay, we're talking about things that are, which are incorruptible. And the first thing is, obviously, God is incorruptible. Now, I'm not going to just give a list of five things that are incorruptible, but I'm going to explain. Number one, God is incorruptible. Because God is incorruptible, we see the next thing that's incorruptible, and that is His Word. God's Word is incorruptible. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. I was on 2 Peter. 1 Peter 1, verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Uh, that's a great verse about incorruption, but that's not the one I was looking for. Uh, let me see here. I wonder if I mixed up with one. We are saved by, let me read that again. We are, we are, sa we are not saved. You were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold in vain conversations received by tradition. I'm looking for where it talks about the incorruptible seed, talking about the Word of God. Huh? Oh, did I not read far enough? Look at verse 23. Sorry about that. I hate that. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Okay, so we see that the Bible is referred to as the seed. Think about Jesus' illustration of the seed, okay? And, the, and then he said, the seed is the Word of God. And what he says in his parable is that the seed is scattered abroad, some of it goes into rocky soil, some of it goes into thorny soil, some of it goes, and then some of it goes into good soil, and that soil then uh, it springs up, you know, uh, uh, this new growth. So the Bible being the word, the, being the seed, or the word of God, is, as we've talked about many times, talked about it on Sunday, the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, okay? The word of God is what gives life, and the word of God is, is really, think about this, the word of God is what saved us. We had to hear the word of God, or we wouldn't know what to believe and how to be saved. Okay, so we have to hear uh, the gospel. So, the, because God is incorruptible, we can trust that his word is incorruptible. Now, this is one of the reasons we have to understand and we have to believe and trust in the fact that God would produce something that is a pure word of God. And so many people out there have made it like, well, yeah, well, he originally spoke something that was the pure word of God, but it's been corrupted over time. And so we got to try to figure out how to get it back. Are you kidding me? The Word of God was corrupt. Is cor now, I, I, I agree that there are corruptions out there, right? But you mean that there's never been, there was never a time in which God gave us His complete Word? Of course He did. It's always been, you know, so every, every time it was added to, uh, as, a, as, you know, one of the apostles wrote these final letters or whatever, it was being completed. The Word of God was in its entirety, right? And so it was, it was uh, God preserved it. And he gave it in a sense that was pure and incorruptible. Now, very important, you know, you say, well, what about all the different versions of the Bible that are out there? Uh, you know, there are verses that I could take from a King James Bible, and I could compare an NIV or an ESV or, or even a New King James in many cases, and those two verses will say something completely different. Or one, uh, one, you'll read one, the King James, and then you'll look at the other, uh, the other corrupted version, and it'll have the verse entirely gone, right? 
So somebody will say this, well, then if then that is a corruptible seed, that's not incorruptible seed. So can anybody get saved from reading a different version of the Bible? Has anybody ever thought about that? Most of the time, people laugh at that and say, well, that's ridiculous, right? You can, you can get say, say using an NIV or an ESV or whatever. I heard somebody say, you can get saved, uh, I don't remember what it was, reading the back of a, of a cereal box or something like that. That was the weirdest thing I ever heard in my life. <laughs> it's got to be the Word of God, right? Telling the gospel of God. But here's the thing. Uh, when, the, when the Word of God is preached, right, and you're preaching, uh, man, I'm getting kind of confused here. <laughs> and the Word of God is being preached, and you're preaching from God's words, right? That's the power and the salvation. Somebody can get saved through that. Now, just because this one version might have certain parts that are left out, or certain parts that are slightly different or whatever, for the most part, you can find salvation verses that are just that are true to the Word of God in these other versions. So if you ever met somebody and they got, and they, they got a salvation testimony and then you find out they don't use a King James, you know, it, it, I think it would be silly to assume, oh, they, they can't be saved then. They could have received the gospel, had the gospel preached to them from the, from the Bible. But we do trust in the fact that the Word of God is incorruptible. I mean, it's, it transcends time. It, all the things in this world might tend towards decay and corruption, but the Word of God is just going to stay firm. Now, there's language barriers. There's translations uh, into other languages. I understand that. We had to get it into English at some point. I understand all that. But the Word of God is there. It's got to exist somewhere. And I'm telling you what, there is no other Bible in the world uh, that is exactly like this Bible. Does that make sense? So there's no Bible in the world that's exactly like this Bible. So that means there's got to be, you know, either this is corrupt or all the other ones are corrupt. And so I believe all the other ones have corruption in them. And that's another message for another day. But the Word, we can trust that if God is incorruptible, His Word is incorruptible. And that's exactly what the Bible says. We are saved by incorruptible seed, which is the Word of God. And then that verse goes on to say, the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. You know, that's what, how we even got saved is we heard the gospel, not because some man convinced us that it's logical that Jesus Christ rose from the dead to pay for our sins. That's not logical. We heard that from the Bible and we trusted it. We believed in it. Okay, and so that leads me to the next point. If God is incorruptible and His Word is incorruptible, look at 1 Peter 1.7. That means that faith in His Word is incorruptible. 1 Peter 1.7. Let's start with 6. Where, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, Ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith... Now, the rest of, the plur, the rest of this sentence is not going to uh, modify uh, trial, but what we're talking about is faith. Okay, The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor of glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. All right? There's one thing in this world that pleases an almighty, incorruptible, perfect God. And he says what it is in Hebrews 11:6. He says, but with, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So you understand then that because God is holy and we're not holy... God is incorruptible, and we're not incorruptible, then we've got to find some way to get from, you know, it's almost like a different dimension. We've got to get, find some way to get from this dimension that we're in of being incorruptible in this fallen world where everything has to perish. We have to get, find some way to get from this world to get to the incorruptible world. And God said, here's the key, faith. 
faith is, is, is incorruptible, right? If I look down in, uh, on the incorruptible world that he created, but remember we're under the curse, and he looks under that, that, uh, that corrupt, the corrupted world that he created, and he says, uh, you know, there's no good on this world. Everything must die. Everything must perish. There's no good. Nobody is good. No, not one. Uh, all are wicked. Even their righteousnesses are as filthy rags, it says in Isaiah. And he looks down and he sees that, but he sees one person that says, yeah, but you know what? You know, you're an incorruptible God, and I want to be incorruptible. I want to be, we use the ter- expression, born again. I want to be born again I, I, into, into a new person who's incorruptible. All right? And the Bible says that our faith is more precious than one of the substances on this earth, that if everything, you know, everything melts away, you think, well, one thing will be left, surely gold, right? Silver, precious stones, those things are going to stay. We understand that. No, God says your faith is even more valuable than all those things because your faith is the key that will get you into that, incor- to that incorruptible place. All right. So 1 Peter uh, 1, seven we read. Okay, so actually, you understand this. Our faith doesn't have anything to do with us. You know, there are people out there that, that, that make this uh, a really difficult thing. And this is where a lot of the Calvinistic idea comes from, where they think that, you know, well, you don't really have anything within your power to call on the name of the Lord, and you don't have an, the ability to choose. You're just totally depraved, and you can't choose God. And this is where this comes from, is because they realize that, hey, how could we, being defiled, being corrupt, how could we pull ourselves up, as it were, and reach God? And the fact is, we can't, right? Right? Our faith has nothing to do with how great we are. So somebody might say, okay, well, I want to be saved. And I know the Bible says you're saved through, by, uh, by grace through faith. How much faith do I have to have? How do I know when I've reached that point of having enough faith? Well, now you're relying on your own self. Anything that you do that, you know, that is your contribution is not good enough. It's, gonna, it's corrupt. Okay, so even in our faith, which is the only way we can be saved, we can't have enough faith. All right? But that doesn't mean that God just chose who he was going to put faith in, and others are going to die and go to hell because he he predestined it to be that way. Uh, That's not what it's saying. What what it's saying is we have to recognize I'm incorruptible. I'm, I'm corrupted, and I'm defiled, and there's no way I can reach a holy God. Right? So I'm just going to trust that if anybody's going to save me, it's got to be him. If I've got any hope of going to heaven, it's got to be by his grace. Right? And so he said in the Bible, you believe that I sent my son to die for you to pay the price? You know, because really the only way for us to be uh, technically to be forgiven of our sins is to suffer an eternity in hell, which we can't ever pay. <laughs> All right? So he sent Jesus to do that. So we're trusting him and we're trusting his gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with us. It's no amount of our ability to save ourselves. Okay? It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But again, some people quote that verse, say it's the gift of God. See, he just gives it to you. Like you don't even have to know it's a gift of God that we have to accept. <laughs> We have, to, uh, we have to receive it, okay? As many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. We have to receive it, okay? So you see this logical pattern. We got number one, God is incorruptible. Number two, because God is incorruptible, his word is incorruptible. Number three, because God's word is incorruptible, faith in his word is incorruptible. Leads us to number four. Hope I don't lose anybody. Because our faith in his word is incorruptible, our born-again bodies are incorruptible. Now make no mistake about it. Everybody in here is going to die and perish and go into the grave. Uh, I was talking to uh, 
Larry, actually, on Sunday, and we were talking about, you know, a lot of these things, conversations just start getting speculatory, you know, and we were talking about Elisha, for instance, and Elisha, you know, just went up in a chariot, and, and Enoch, you know, walked with God, and then he was not, and uh, you think about all this, and you start wondering, like, like, how does that, how did that happen exactly? Like, like, did he, did his body just go to heaven? Is it in heaven to this day, the same body that walked around this earth? I don't believe that's possible because it was corrupt, right? I believe on his way up, this body had to have perished. Maybe it burned up in the atmosphere. I don't know. <laughs> this body had to perish. And, uh, and one day he'll come back, I believe, uh, in, the, in the end times. I think he's one of the two witnesses, but that's another story. Uh, but the, uh, uh, so you have to... Uh, you have to just think about this, that every, nobody, in fact, I, I think it would, the Bible would have to be wrong if anybody is up in heaven right now in this body, because the Bible says that Jesus was the first person, right, that that ever happened. And nobody else will have that happen to them until the second coming. Let's read about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, because our faith in his word is incorruptible, our born again bodies are incorruptible, not our physical bodies, because these bodies have to go, but we receive eternal life through Jesus, right? When we get saved, we receive eternal life. He says, you have the son hath life. But guess what? We don't get it. We don't see it in, uh, in this body. Uh, it doesn't get that until this day that we're about to read about. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 35. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it the body, a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are, all, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. You know, I mean, we, we, can, we can only see so far with our eyes, you know, scientists, astronomers, uh, ast astronomers or astrologers, <laughs> astronomers have looked up and tried to see the difference between all these uh, heavenly, uh, these planets and stars and all these, uh, but we, with our eyes, can see differences. There's a big difference between looking at the moon and looking at the sun. There's a big difference between looking at the stars that are really far away. Uh, and then some of them, some of the planets, now this is what I heard before. I don't know if this is true, but if you look up in a star and it's blinking, it's a star. Have you ever heard that? Am I right on that? And if it doesn't blink, then it's a planet. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but you can see with our eyes, there are differences between these things. Just like when I look at a fish, hey, that body looks a lot different than the fish, I mean, than a, than a bird, all right? Again, evolutionists think that those scales turned into uh, feathers. <laughs> it's the craziest thing, right? No, God's saying, look, he made all these different beings. He made one with scales. He made one with, uh, with feathers, right? And he made, there are these different types of, of bodies. And here's what it says. So also, verse 42, is the resurrection of the dead. Now, we've not seen this day. Uh, none of us have gotten glorified bodies. The resurrection happens when Christ comes back. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. All of our bodies are going to die because all of our bodies, no matter how good you think you are, is dishonorable. No matter how, you know, I, I just really turned over a new leaf and cleaned up my life. No, it still falls short. It still can't be saved. It is raised in glory, even though it was dishonorable. It's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. 
It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Guess what your natural body is going to do? It's going to die and it's going to get corrupt and worms are going to eat it or fish if you, if you die in the sea. And <laughs> you're going to, or if you die in the fire, you're going to be cremated, whatever. This body is going to perish. But, the, uh, but because our faith in the Word of God is incorruptible, God said, hey, I am going to clothe that born-again person. I'm going to clothe that spirit with a body, and that body is going to be incorruptible. Number five, because our bodies, glorified bodies, are incorruptible, He's given us an inheritance and a reward which are incorruptible. These are all the words that the Bible uses. I'm not making these up or stretching them. This is where you find the word incorruptible. First Peter again. First Peter. Chapter 1, verse 4. Let's do verse 3. I always go too far. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again, that's born again, right? The new birth, begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. We have a home in heaven that's incorruptible. I've talked about this before, but we don't have to worry that by the time we get there, it's going to already be, you know, used up and somebody's used it or starting to decay or starting to mold or anything like that. It's incorruptible. And Jesus said in John 14, 1 through 3, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, I know he was talking to his disciples whenever he said that, but he has got a place there for us. Now, I don't know what it looks like. You know, I got a mansion just over the hilltop. I, I don't know what that looks like. People talk about, oh, yeah, well, mine's going to be a little cabin out in the middle of nowhere, and I'm going to go fishing every day. No, you're not. <laughs> You're going to spend your whole life serving God, and that's what you're going to want to do because you're going to have an incorruptible body. <laughs> I've heard people say, like, oh, that's what heaven's going to be like. I don't even want to go there. Well, you're foolish because <laughs> you don't understand uh, how God can give greater joy than anything that we could ever find on this earth, okay? And so God has prepared a place for us, and that's where our body is going to dwell, the incorruptible body He's going to give us. And then not only that, but he's going to uh, reward us for the work that we do uh, on this earth for him. All the things that weren't for him aren't going to, you know, they're going to perish because those are the those are the corruptible things uh, that we do that are just temporary and they only gratify us for a little while, but they're going to die and perish. But the things we do for Christ. Those are going to last, and we're going to be rewarded for those. 1 Corinthians 9.25 says this, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Here's what he says. If you want to win the race and receive the crown, or the medal, or the trophy, or the belt buckle, or whatever it is you want to do, uh, you're going to strive for mastery. You're going to work hard. You're going to discipline yourself. You're going to make a lot of sacrifices, but it's worth it because you got your eye on the prize and you know what, uh, what you want. And so you're going to, it's going to be worth it for you to, do all the, uh, to put all the work and the labor into it. But here's what he says. Now they do it for, to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible right? Whatever the reward is that God's going to give us for the work that we do on this earth... That's an incorruptible reward. It's not something that's going to perish. It's not something that's going to get thrown into our junk drawer and we're going to forget about it or it's going to get tarnished or it's going to be sold in a yard sale one day. <laughs> this is an incorruptible prize. So it's hard for us to fathom 
in this corruptible world with our corruptible minds. It's hard for us to fathom anything that's actually incorruptible, that doesn't perish or fade away. And that's only because we're in this flesh. But we understand that God, when he created all things in the very beginning, they were incorruptible. We know God's incorruptible, and uh, we trust that. And so uh, his word is incorruptible. That's where we come to faith in him. Our faith is incorruptible, and then our bodies are going to be incorruptible, and then the place and the rewards that he gives to us are incorruptible. Now, keeping that in mind, turn to Matthew chapter 6, and we'll close. Matthew chapter 6. I feel like often we, this is a repeating theme, like we just keep coming back to this, because so much of the Bible, this is exactly what it's saying. We've got to constantly remind ourselves. Why? Because we're in this corruptible, this corrupted flesh. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, giving us hope. And I was just thinking today that if, uh, if, if there was any possible way, which I know there's not, that I was wrong about eternity and wrong about my faith in, in you, uh, then this life would literally have absolutely no meaning and be worthless and, uh, and there would be nothing to live for. Uh, but we know that we have an eternal home in heaven promised to us. And so the short time that we have here on this, on this earth, Lord, help us to use it to lay up treasures in heaven, things that are incorruptible, things that aren't going to fade away. Lord, help us not get distracted by the fact that we don't have certain things or we don't have enough material goods or money or, or valuable things, but help us lay up treasures in heaven. Uh, whatever we can do, Lord, that would get us rewards, whether it's giving somebody the gospel, whether it's sacrificing, giving to others, uh, whatever it is that you show us from your word that you want to reward Help us to do those things, Lord, so that we will have those incorruptible uh, rewards in heaven. Lord, bless the night. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's all stand.